Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark. Look, I enjoyed this movie, and I will do a more thorough review on it at a later date like I did with Train to Busan, but with Sins videos and the internet in general, it's easier to be negative than it is to be positive. Now let's pick apart this movie and get right to it. It wouldn't be a sequel to a zombie apocalypse without seeing a city with tons of smoke and zombies pretending to be dead on the ground at the start. This family is out in the middle of the road screaming. I know they're trying to get help from a car driven by a soldier, but once they ditch them, you would think they would attempt to get back in their car or something instead of making tons of noise out in the open. We get some English speaking people doing a comfortable news broadcast about the outbreak saying no one really knows what the virus is, but that it indeed started from the bio factory that Sok Woo financially backed out of in the first movie. So Busan was completely overrun despite the bittersweet ending of Train to Busan where the pregnant Yumi and the young girl Suan arrived at an evacuation point with armed military guard. Sad to say, but neither of these characters return in this film, which it's fine to have a whole new set of characters in the same universe for a sequel. I just really want to know what happened to them beyond the explanation of Busan got overwhelmed. Ah uh, yes, the cancelled pilot to the series, Plane to Busan. We also can't have it being short footage of a zombie outbreak without something big exploding or crashing on camera. So a couple videos back, I was right in the fact that North Korea pretty much locked down the border to South Korea when this all started, but I don't know how I feel about them pretty much saying good thing North Korea stayed the way it did, considering North Korea's Kim possible state of reality. People are evacuated on an overcrowded boat as the military reroutes them to Hong Kong, making this boat to Hong Kong. When we see a man slowly turning into an infected, convulsing, and all that noise. How do these infected people keep their symptoms suppressed enough to go unnoticed through military checkpoints? And yes, in the panic it would be hard to check every survivor, but this guy somehow doesn't fully turn the entire time he's getting into the boat and just sitting there for a long time while in safety. He must have been bitten over half an hour ago. It seems like the infection time only lasts this long for people that get on mass transit vehicles, but people that get bitten anywhere else turn in a matter of seconds. Apparently, there were no armed soldiers in this holding area where all these people are and where this guy turned. Maybe, I don't know, have someone strapped and prepared to pop anyone that could possibly turn at any moment considering this disease shut down the South Korean government and wiped out a large majority of the population in one day. No, apparently the soldiers there are just cosmetic and are there just to report that there are indeed infected that were spotted and causing chaos down below, while all armed personnel decided to go up on top of the ship and sing some Lonely Island. Because infected always know to jump scare and drop on people from behind for a thrilling cinematic experience. Despite shooting the infected a few times, no others show up and instead we have an entire room convulsing and succumbing to the infection. All pretty much so we can have this dramatic moment of this mother holding her turning son. Why are a dozen people not instantly attacking her or the soldier? The baseball couple in the first movie had less than a minute before the girlfriend turned and sunk her teeth into her boyfriend that was holding her. But this child with a probably weaker immune system and a whole galley of people can resist long enough to only turn one by one so this sad scene of the mom refusing to leave her son can transpire and give the soldier enough time to escape. While it is an emotionally devastating and gripping scene, I'm still gonna have to add three sins for the infected not abiding by their own rules. Oh, now they all turn at once so we can have the shutting the door just in time for a horde to slam against it cliche. Oh, now every soldier on the ship decides to show up. The newscast said one of the last lifeboats had infected hosts, and because of this, all neighboring countries refused refugees from there on out. Would have been easier to accept refugees if the military personnel would have just kept an eye on the room where all the refugees were in the first place, instead of letting it get out of hand in a small space. Although it does make sense for a disease like this to be strictly quarantined, the lifeboat survivors were stupidly killed off for narrative purposes. Yes, it's been four years already. Yes. 
four years. Hey guys, I think it's been four years since Train to Busan happened, but I'm not sure though. Maybe repeated a few more times. Yes, four years. I will say the title of Peninsula is perfect, since South Korea is basically quarantined and wiped from existence, where characters refer to the new land as just the peninsula. Should I say your country or the peninsula? since the only way by land to get there is locked off by North Korean occupation via land. So it is a more valid reason for zombies to be focused in one area without spreading too far. And now we have a group of people arranging a plan to go back into the peninsula in order to get a truck full of money. They are doing a money recovery mission with the sequel to Train to Busan? This is starting to feel like a hammy action Americanized film compared to its predecessor. I will say the discrimination of South Koreans in this reality seems very realistic as people assume they may carry the virus. I could see that totally happening with how people are. Minus one sin for a better reality check. A team of former South Koreans head out in a boat back into the peninsula with a Chinese guy that sounds like he was dubbed over promising to pick them back up in three days. I'm surprised there isn't heavier naval guard in the surrounding areas of the peninsula, considering how catastrophic it would be if someone with terroristic intent caught any number of these infected and used them to start outbreaks in other countries. I feel like there would be way heavier defenses around all of former South Korea. I don't feasibly see a car turning on and being fully drivable after being left alone for four years. The gas would either be degraded or vaporized, and the battery would probably be long dead since it's been inactive. Also, the fact that they can so easily drive through the city with cars piled up on the highway and no hordes of infected is a miracle. Speaking of miracles, there are a number of ways to protect yourself online from ravenous zombie-like malware while also allowing yourself to watch more zombie content not available in your country. For a limited time, get 83% off a two-year plan and three extra months on top of that for free at surfshark.deals slash stay wow. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 per month so you can browse securely on all your devices, including your tablets, smartphones, and computers with no limit to how many devices you can link your account to, which is pretty handy when trying to watch shows that aren't available in your country. Because just like me and my girlfriend who lives in Hungary, it can be a little bit hard watching the same shows like when we want to watch Kingdom, The Walking Dead, or Train to Busan on Netflix. But through Surfshark, it's as easy as to changing your VPN to a country of your choice. So, unlike people restricted to only watching a wall in the peninsula, you can watch what you want and safely do it online. With Surfshark's camouflage mode that allows you to browse anonymously where even your own internet provider can't even tell you're using a VPN. Go to surfshark.deal slash staywell and use code staywell to get 83% off a two-year plan and three extra months for free. Thank you for sponsoring today's video, Surfshark. Now, back to the sins. Jong Suk looks through his night scope at a glass wall, and the music screeches to jump scare us as we see infected piled up against it. Why were they bunched up, foaming at the mouth, and stuck in here in the first place, going against the glass? I thought they couldn't see at night or in dark areas, and became relatively docile when the lights went out. So why are they so ravenously at the window already? To time things even better, the full moon comes out from behind a cloud to reveal the infected more and give them some light to see the main characters. Considering everyone is fully knowledgeable of how light affects their sight, you would think they would schedule this heist during a new moon or at least some kind of crescent phase of the moon to have less light shining naturally over the cityscape, not during the cast of a full moon. The group, while being spied on by a young girl, finds the truck full of tens of millions of dollars that somehow wasn't stolen or burned up in the fiery panic of the outbreak or the four years after. The crew see the seemingly dead corpse of the truck's original driver and decide it would be a great idea to reach over it without making sure it was dead with his neck near the corpse's mouth. What could possibly go wrong? 
Why is this particular infected pretending to be dead, or I guess maybe sleeping, when no others have been shown to do this up until this point? Did it somehow know someone would show up after four years coming to look for the $20 million and thought, hey, if I just lay here, someone will eventually come and reach over me so I could easily bite them. In the panic, he slams the car horn to add tension. And I gotta say, this girl would be great at zombie sense. Kill machine dead. How was he not bitten here? I could have swore I heard a biting sound. <laughs> A horde of infected apparently can't be heard until they emerge from the nearby shadows. So let's just sit here in the street and stare long enough for them to get close instead of getting in the $20 million truck. I'm surprised these car alarms are still functioning after four years. You would think either the battery would be dead or the post-apocalypse would have set these alarms off years ago. But I guess they needed a plot device to mimic the car lot from the parish in Left 4 Dead 2. Getting away by car just in time for the horde to barely catch up, cliche. With their mission complete, they are driving towards the docks to leave when a random survivor in the street fires a few flares in front of the two-car convoy. Why would you stop your car to look at a flare on the road? They do know the sound and light that this thing is making will attract infected, right? Infected start pouring in towards this. The woman driver panics, and after hitting a few zombies, they crash and then get hit by the box truck that's right behind them. Their plan failed because of a few road flares? Really? Zombies are never on the streets unless either a light or sound source is made. Are they like the Left 4 Dead infected and only spawn once an alarm goes off? The drivers of the original car get swarmed by infected and killed immediately. But the drivers of the box truck get the zombies that only pin them down and not bite them and just tackle them. You gotta love that plot armor. He punches a few infected and I guess they just die? I mean, he punches them and we don't see them again. I thought these infected were more resilient than that. The one infected in the giant landscape behind Jong Suk gets absolutely creamed by this vehicle that comes out of nowhere. It made no sound and somehow was able to stealth its way through busy and cluttered streets. You gotta love those last second plot convenient save the day moment. Jong Suk was launched out of a moving vehicle onto pavement and is able to gather his bearings, fight off a few infected and get away. Because apparently these particular infected cannot climb over the car wall and instead try to go through a small opening in the car pile up all at once as if they have Three Stooges syndrome. Move it, shout ahead. We call it Three Stooges Syndrome. Jun E drives this armored vehicle as if she was straight out of Fast and Furious. I'm surprised she drives this well considering she has been in a zombie apocalypse for four years. How did she get this kind of training? And I have to say this feels way out of place to have action driving like this. Drifting into hordes, driving at 100 miles per hour through tight alleys? What the hell is this movie? The fact that I thought this little girl that we saw in the second trailer for Peninsula in the passenger seat was Suwon from Train to Busan is actually a completely different character named Yu Jin left me feeling immensely depressed. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. After running through hordes of zombies without any issue, Juni suddenly says, oh, this particular horde I can't plow through. So Eugene pulls out a light up RC car and does even more drifting through the horde. What is the writer's obsession with cars and badass driving for this particular film? based on the Train to Busan universe. How can she see where the car is going in order to avoid being grabbed, trampled, or hitting any obstacles for so long? There's no camera on the RC car, and she is only using night vision goggles to operate this thing. A gang of former military show up with their leader, Sergeant Huang, to find a man that is bitten. The bitten man apparently hasn't turned yet, so we can hastily insert the movie's antagonists, killing him with a blow to the head. And to have this whole group portrayed as evil for saying inhumane stuff. Hey man, four years into this, 
an unknown bitten guy showing up wouldn't exactly get any mercy. Jung Suk apparently passed out and is in this family's hideout. I don't understand why they would have risked their asses trying to save him, especially since the former military group we were just introduced to, named Unit 631, is out there looking to kill or enslave others. Because South Korea is a small country and it's a small world after all, the woman that Jong Suk as a soldier ignored and drove away from four years ago is actually alive and here to make him question himself and his bravery. The third platoon of Unit 631 procures the box truck and returns to their base. They find out Chul Min, one of the original group there to get the money, is in the back and they take him away. You would think the leader, Sergeant Huang, who wants to kill Captain So over not getting one can of tuna over a mission accomplished, would check the back for what kind of haul they just got because supplies are limited. But nah, let the guy with the limp check instead. Surely he won't hide whatever's in the back. Ooh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I wonder what the message of this movie is. We see the second antagonist, Captain So, as a suicidal but spoiled man who was interrupted right before offing himself. Good thing his lackey showed up at this exact moment or there would be less dramatic tension later on. Unit 631 has repurposed a shopping mall into a fight club arena where they keep captured survivors in containers and periodically throw them out defenseless against infected they release for 120 seconds, wagering supplies and food on each numbered survivor. Wagering supplies and food on each numbered person if they survive or not. While the concept is interesting, it's getting pretty tiresome seeing the antagonistic group of a zombie film or game keeping zombies in their safe haven for fun, sport, or defense, only for them to break out and cause chaos and an easy escape for the hero near the end of the act or movie. It always seems like villains when it comes to zombies in their safe haven are like this helicopter pilot. Where nothing can possibly go wrong. Uh, possibly go wrong. <laughs> that's the first thing that's ever gone wrong. Joe's lackey says the truck was full of US dollars, but I'm surprised in the span of four years, this truck hadn't already been picked up by them and cleaned by scavengers. I will say the cinematography and again, the concept of the survivors versus infected fight club thing is still pretty neat, even if it is hammy. It definitely serves as the highlight of this film. So I'll take off one cent. That is until this pile of, I guess, combined infected come crawling out like a pile of ants. I mean, the concept is interesting, but is this just a game of vile twister gone wrong? Or did their flesh fuse from being clumped together for so long? It makes for a good spot in the trailers and a oh shit moment. But I gotta ask, how is this possible considering every other infected up until this point and even the infected in that glass building are able to separate easily and are able to go in their own separate paths. So I don't understand how this is possible. So five out of the over a dozen captured survivors are bitten and turn in this one round against the infected. That's actually a big percentage for a limited pool of competitors four years into a zombie apocalypse. How do they have this many people to use for this vile sport anyways. And I have to add this on top of it. Each of the survivors used in this game are shirtless with numbers on their front and back bare flesh. Yet all of the infected depicted here that attack them are fully clothed and unmarked. You would think many of these infected would be former competitors at this point and be shirtless with numbers on their body. And this isn't a sin, just had to throw a joke in here, but this is basically the US government when it comes to handing out stimulus checks during the coronavirus outbreak. <laughs> Captain So starts scheming to abandon Unit 631 to head to Incheon Port to take the money and run and asks if it will be dangerous to go with only two people, even asking if zombies bite. I get that he is the lazy do-nothing leader type who is pretty much distant from what's actually going on in the world, but what kind of question is that? Oh look, now the streets are full of zombies and wrecked cars. 
Too bad it won't be this way when main characters are driving through the city at over 100 miles per hour. <laughs> Sacrificial foreshadowing. The family head out in a vehicle at night as Min Jung spends a good minute loving her kids and preparing them for if she does not return. You know, it's really hard to get emotionally attached and expect anything bad to happen to these characters when they have disaster movie main character syndrome, where the mother, children, and possibly father types will most likely live in the end to give audiences a generic happy ending. Min Jung and John Sok infiltrate 631's compound to retrieve the $20 million filled box truck so their boat rescue will welcome them aboard because they're not getting aboard without that truck. While Captain So, with a similar plot, decides to distract Unit 631 by saying that the box truck that they retrieved contained one month's supply of food and supplies for these, what, 50 people? and that they are all allowed to celebrate and party for 24 hours, no one that was near the truck when they stole it at the time wanted to verify this absolute banger of a surplus of food that they are suddenly going to go ham on now? They were all just concerned over taking a hostage to put in their game? I think they would check to see what was in the box truck to make these sudden celebrations happen. The sergeant and captain are questioning each other as So's plan slowly starts to take motion behind Huang's back. And as Huang begins to suspect something fishy, the lackey to So pops in, and instead of thinking an insurrection is breeding, Huang assumes these two gentlemen have been attempting some homoerotic breeding and leaves them alone just like that. He stops suspecting them because he thinks they're gay? Really? Jong Suk and Min Jung find the truck with the money still in it. I'm surprised no one in Unit 631, the leaders, or even the lackey tried to hide the money or see what was in it. And then So's lackey shows up to basically conveniently tell our heroes there is a second satellite phone and random members of Unit 631 yell about Chul Min still being alive inside as a competitor because we need exposition dumps at the end to give us a flashy final act. With his lackey at the end of a barrel, Captain So pretends to reach for the satellite phone, but he whips out a Glock and tries to pop her. Thankfully, main characters will have awful aim and cannot be shot until the story absolutely needs it. Jung Suk goes into this former military compound in the mall, guns blazing, and not a single person there fights back at first, no one is armed? You would think at least three or four of them would be carrying, considering they are literally housing infected that could somehow break loose at any moment if they're not careful. And talk about plot armor time convenience. The one time Chul Min, while he is in this fighting arena, is actually about to get bitten in this dangerous game, Jung Sok is able to shoot down this slow motion zombie mid pounce in the midst of dozens of Unit 631 members and other infected. How? Jong Suk somehow got inside the caged off Fight Club arena to kill only a few zombies while a former military group just watched and ran away. I realized they were in the midst of partying, but seriously, not one person had a weapon? Let's toss a smoke grenade in the air and shoot it like a badass. Not like you'll need to keep a careful count on your ammo or anything. A majority of Unit 631 returns with guns a minute later. Jong Suk fires a flare and apparently about a dozen infected pour out from the smoke. Where were these infected the whole time if they can rush out in these numbers? How was Jong Suk and his brother-in-law not attacked by infected that entire time? And just as I predicted, the infected break out and start attacking Unit 631. Who would have thought? Jong Sok is able to shoot and kill three of the enemy soldiers. But in this situation, he is not hit once by this spray and pray. You gotta love plot armor. More infected, tackling the main characters instead of instantly biting them, cliche. Three enemies firing assault rifles cannot hit Jong Sok. And on top of that, he has time to grab a dead body and use it as a meat shield in this quick situation? How? Jong Seok is loudly being pinned by an infected, and this group of seven armed 631 troops cannot catch up to him and gun him down? Nah, gotta give Chul Min enough time to grab the gun on the ground and spray and pray the approaching squad and get a double kill. I know this is supposed to be a sad death considering Chul Min is his brother-in-law, but I mean, there wasn't 
isn't much to Chul's character outside of wanting to get money and being used in a torturous sport. Unit 631 and their numerous soldiers give Jung Seok this long amount of time to cry over his fallen family member. Jung slides in the DMs with sad music and is able to single-handedly kill seven 631 members Good thing they politely step aside while each one individually fights him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Not like they could shoot him while he's fighting him back or anything. Oh, look! Sergeant Huang actually grew a brain, and he's about to do what I just said. He's gonna shoot him. Holy freaking deus ex zombie now, what the hell, where did that come from? So Min Jung knew exactly where in this mall to drive this valuable box truck through to save Jung Seok at the last second. Good thing Jung was near a glass wall when this all went down, but how did she know exactly where to show up and to drive through? And why is she risking the box truck that needs to be brought to the port to these people on the boat in order to escape by ramming it through a building? You might have made this truck inoperable, but hey, whatever, I'm thinking about it too much. It's an action movie. We're supposed to say, dude, that was cool, man. Jung just sits there staring at everything because it's a sad, somber moment. And in antagonists are not allowed to attempt to kill you while you're having a sad moment. Only when you are successfully driving away do they get to try. The box truck gets stuck on a horde of zombies and they are about to swarm inside the truck when the family armored car shows up in the nick of time once again to distract them. Now the CGI truck is able to run over zombies without any issue because the zombies are running away from it because that is how physics work. They are able to Tokyo drift this corner of the street in order to fire flares down the other corner to get the infected to run in the opposite direction. While this is badass, how is any of this possible? Unit 631 somehow caught up with them and shows up right behind them in a Mad Max style car chase. But why do these violent psychopaths only fire flares at their targets at first and not just shoot them or the car's tires with their actual loaded assault rifles? Nah, instead of shooting these people that killed half of your soldiers and are making off with a month's supply of food, they start banging their cars against them at high speeds instead. What could possibly go wrong? Sergeant Huang now starts saying to shoot to kill. Why wait until then if you're already chasing them down and want them dead? This chase sequence makes no sense at all. A box truck is able to outdrive the multi-car convoy of Unit 631. On top of that, the streets widen up enough for all this to go down so we can have this cool car chase. But then suddenly, they go in a tight pathway for some of the cars to go flying off in a stylishly destructive fashion? And then we get the insane laughing dude with metal spikes on his tire rims to start chasing the family car to pop their tires or whatever, as both cars have apparent professional stunt drivers that can make tight turns and drive off bridges like this easily. This looks more like a video game cutscene where you tap X every once in a while instead of a movie. So they are driving through these alleyways at what I would assume to be nearly over 100 miles per hour without any obstructions. In these tight alleyways, I think there would be something on the road to stop a car going that fast. The family driver pulls out her night scope and instantly finds a horde of zombies ahead in the alleyway like she would know they would be there. How convenient. <laughs> She literally spins around, turns on her headlights in this alleyway, and it alerts the horde of zombies. And then the car keeps driving in reverse. This is way too over the top and hammy for what is supposed to be the sequel to Train to Busan, man. Wait, this hammy plan where she attracts the zombies with her headlights in a spin actually works? Half a dozen zombies attack the crazy guy's truck instead, and he decides to cut left really hard to crash into the building. What is this movie? Sergeant Huang catches up to the box truck and both of the men aim their weapons at each other, but neither of them shoot once in this situation. As Huang tells Unit 631 to turn on the spotlights attached to their vehicles and suddenly every zombie in the city is descending on the car chase? Where were any of these zombies during the entire chase? I realize they're basically blind in the dark and that light attracts them, 
but that doesn't mean they still wouldn't be wandering around in the streets by themselves. Jong Sok sits out their box truck window, slowly shooting each spotlight. Considering his basically static position and how the lights are nearly blinding him, you would think any passengers in the convoy of Unit 631 could easily shoot and kill him. But nah, you gotta let him do his thing. He's vibing shooting them like. One of the convoy catches up to them and instead of trying to shoot the driver, they try and reach into the car and try to stab her? What? How the hell have these guys survived for four years with these brain dead actions? The family car drifts into a zombie horde. The horde piles up after being knocked over and one of the convoy of unit 631 hits the pile and flips over. Why did this movie turn into Fast and Furious with zombies? Okay, last time I'll bring this up, but how is this road so wide open without obstruction or zombies to get in the way? Another convoy vehicle literally flips because of zombies jumping off a bridge, but the family car just speeds up and avoids it completely. Do you remember that scene of Jong Seok in the beginning of the movie looking at the glass with all of those zombies stuck inside, unable to break the glass? Conveniently, when there is only Huang's car left chasing them, the box truck is passing by this exact building and Jung shoots the glass causing it to break just in time for Huang's car to pile drive into this mass of zombies and this causes Huang's car to fully stop as the zombies break through the windshield and kill them. This movie is rife with plot conveniences out of nowhere and it's cool and stuff but it's way too cheesy for my tastes. I'm gonna add three more sins to end off this Mad Max and Fast and Furious hybrid inspired fever dream. Right as they are about to arrive at Inchin Port, a car comes out of nowhere and slams into the family vehicle. It turns out that Captain Soga from earlier perfectly timed this wreck in order to get the box truck back by wrecking into a random car driving away? How did So get to the port fast enough to get ahead of these people to pull this off? considering the last time we saw him, he was sitting in a car singing to himself while everyone else had already hauled ass out of the compound. We now have a sudden hostage situation with So holding Jun E at gunpoint. The little sister uses her toy car to distract him, but the elder and Min Jung get shot while So drives away in the box truck towards the port to get away. Good thing he used his fast travel and auto aim to get there to have this final scene because that's what the movie demanded. Even better because when So gets on the boat, he is gunned down by the Chinese guy who wanted the money, showing that these people planned to betray and murder whoever brought the box truck full of money back. This is pretty convenient for our heroes that So literally took a bullet for them. So is shot multiple times and is able to live long enough to put the truck in reverse in order to bash the boat's hatch open and let the zombies in so that all the greedy bad guys die in the end. You would think the boat would have already taken off, but we gotta, you know, have some karma for the bad guys. Elder Kim slowly bleeds out from his gunshot wound. Amidst all the out loud crying by the family and standing out in the open in broad daylight, I'm surprised surprised not a single zombie sees and goes after them. Luckily, the United Nations Major Jane that Elder Kim spoke to over the ham radio earlier in the film shows up in a helicopter at this exact moment that he dies. You know, after four years of him talking to her over the ham radio and wanting assistance to get out of South Korea and them refusing to help them, the United Nations decides, hey, some movie level shit just happened with these people. Some movie level shit just happened with these people. We might as well pick them up despite worldwide quarantine orders. They decide to set off fireworks to alert the helicopter to their whereabouts as Min Jung prepares to sacrifice herself. As Jung Seok is escaping with the girls, this horde just comes out of nowhere. It literally spawns next to them to attack them from all sides. I feel like I'm watching Left 4 Dead if the game elements were a part of reality. You would think the horde would be going after the sounds of the helicopter 
and not a few people on the ground. Min Jung is able to perfectly snipe a few infected from far away to keep them off her family. Min Jung is able to find an unlocked semi and starts honking the still working horn to gain their attention. This time, unlike what happened with Sergeant Huang, they cannot easily break into the vehicle so she can have her time to herself. You're telling me the horde of zombies are only after the truck that honked a few times and not the helicopter that is basically drowning out all other sound right now at the end of the dock? I would think zombies would be going after the instead of a honk, but what do I know about zombies? I'm just a shitty YouTube channel. Min Jung is about to kill herself in full view of her kids when Major Jane says Min Jung is making a sensible decision. While I don't disagree with her, she isn't even trying to shield the kids' view or force them inside the helicopter into safety. Jane does not try and prevent them from seeing their mom about to blow her brains out. And instead, Jane is basically saying, no, you kids need to see this. It's gonna be wild. It'll change your life forever. Jong Suk, wanting to redeem himself, dashes to her rescue. None of the military there tries to prevent him from doing this. And Jong Suk comes in guns blazing. Min Jung hears his gunshot and her daughter screaming for her to run. And she stops herself from killing herself. How the hell did she hear all of that with all the infected screaming and pounding against the vehicle? as well as the whirring of the helicopter. Now that she's invigorated with their kids saying that she, they want her to live, I guess, she easily guns down half the horde and beats away the other half while limping as Jung Seok gives her covering fire. After a perfectly placed smokescreen and two car doors that stop an entire horde of infected, they easily get away as the United Nations finally decide to help instead of just sitting there. And then the UN sees no problem in just letting the kids run back inland to let the family hug it out in the open in broad daylight after all that gunfire and the infected still pouring in. You know what? I guess zombies are just scared of helicopters. Because we have to have a happy ending because audiences don't want to be depressed by reality, the family, minus the grandfather, get away via helicopter without any further issues Aw, a heartwarming ending where everything works out. That's exactly how I want all my zombie movies to end. The final line of the film is... In a few hours, a new world will be waiting. The word I knew wasn't bad either. Bitch, are you kidding me? You just came out of a world of four years of a zombie apocalypse. I think things are going to get a little better than barely scraping by each and every day and worrying if zombies will break down your door. But to each their own, I guess. To sum things up, this was not a good sequel to Train to Busan. And even on its own, it just felt like another generic action slash disaster film that hit every generic note in a formulaic way. And it didn't really stand out with its characters, story writing, or action sequences. Why did they go fast and furious with half of the movie? I don't understand that. Some people will say, why are you comparing it to Train to Busan so much? Look on the movie poster. It's literally called Train to Busan Presents Peninsula. So all I gotta say is I was vastly disappointed. Wow. 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 Oh my god! Ah! Don't worry about the zombies. Don't say that. What? That? What? That? The dead word. Don't say it. Why not? Because it's ridiculous. Alright. Come with me if you want to live. You call this a zombie apocalypse? Don't hold a candle to the great zombie attack of 57. Are you okay? I used to say I lived my life a quarter mile at a time. And I think that's why we were brothers. Because you did too. <laughs>